Walter, part one. Walter is actually a story from my family tree. Walter is my grandpa's grandpa, so he's my great-great-grandfather. Walter was adopted by a man named Harrison and his wife named Lavinia just before the year 1900. No one really knew where Walter came from. The stories hadn't been passed down. People were very quiet. The rumor was that a young relative had gotten pregnant out of wedlock and that Harrison and Lavinia were raising this baby as their own to spare this girl the shame. But again, nobody knew exactly which relative or who it was. And of course, I just had to solve this mystery. I had my grandpa, his sister, and three of his brothers all DNA test. Of course, they came back as full siblings. We know that's good. I was able to immediately rule out the rumor that a young relative had gotten pregnant out of wedlock. There was absolutely no genetic connection to Harrison or Lavinia. Walter, part two. Walter's nickname was Mac, and no one knew why he was called this. My grandpa and his siblings kind of thought that maybe it might be related to his birth family, but no one really knew. So while I was going through my grandpa and his siblings' DNA matches, I actually came across this. One of their DNA matches had a Walter Mack listed, born the same day in the same place. This couldn't be coincidence. Mack was in his name, which has always been theorized was part of his birth family, and he was born the same day in the same place. Walter was actually born in Poinette, Wisconsin. I lucked out, and his parents were listed. So, of course, I kept tracing the DNA, always follow the DNA. And sure enough, a grandson of Walter Mack's brother, Harry, pops up on my grandpa's DNA matches. But why did William Mack and his wife, August, give up all three of their kids? Walter, part three. I've dealt with a lot of historical adoptions, and this was an incredibly unusual situation. This couple had been married since 1886, and they had a total of four children, including one that died in infancy. They were in their 30s. They were married. What could have possibly happened that made them give up all three of their children? I tried doing some digging, even outside the box, and I kept coming up short. So I reached out to the Poinette Area Historical Society, and this amazing woman named Mary helped me out. Because the Poinette Press doesn't have their newspapers archived online, Mary was able to go find me this clipping in person. August died of blood poisoning exactly a month after her last baby was born. You have to remember in the 1890s, maternity care was not very good and the risk of complications were high. With August dead, poor William was left with three young children, including a one-month-old baby. Walter, part four. In the 1890s, it was common practice that if your wife died and you had young children, you found a new wife. This might seem like an absurd idea to us in our modern age. However, at the time, it was a necessity. In the 1890s, men didn't really care for the children. The mom did it. And if your wife died, you had to find a new mom. I may never know why, but for some reason, Walter's dad, William, didn't do this. Instead, William went off the deep end. He started drinking and getting into public fights. He was arrested for disorderly conduct and stealing. At one point, he was arrested for stealing a buggy from a neighbor and was sentenced to six months in jail. I can't help but wonder what happened to the kids while their dad was in jail. Who was taking care of them? The more I looked, the more I found about William's drinking and stealing and robbing. Maybe after the loss of August, alcohol was the only way he could cope. Walter, part five. William was left with three young children all on his own, and in 1894, something tragic happened. The state of Wisconsin intervened, taking custody of the young children and removing them from William's care. In 1894, you could legally beat your child in front of the shed and no one batted an eye. What was William doing that was so horrible the state had to intervene? William's dad was a widower. His wife had died quite young, so obviously he couldn't take three children on himself. But where were August's parents and family members? August was actually quite the mystery. I knew she was born in Germany from census records, but I couldn't find any records of her before she came to America. Again, follow the DNA. It turns out August wasn't a shell at all. She was a shield, and she came over with her parents when she was a young girl. Lucky for me, I was able to connect her lines through DNA. I really don't know why either family didn't step in. Walter, part six. Walter and his brother Harry went to the state home for dependent and neglected children in Sparta, Wisconsin. 
Their sister went to live with William's father and her aunts because the children's home didn't accept children under three until 1901. The home actually had a really good reputation. It was in operation for 89 years, and former residents spoke highly of the food and staff. Many children did die at this home, though, due to outbreaks such as scarlet fever, influenza, polio, and diphtheria. In some records I found, former residents stated that the hospital wing was more a wait-to-die wing, and they only sent you there to keep you away from the other children and prevent them from getting sick. In 1999, one of the former counselors, June Laxton, pushed to have the names of the children put on the gravestones. Originally, there were only numbers due to privacy laws at the time. June was able to push for these records, and they were able to identify all but 20 graves. Walter, part seven. The kids are gone now, so where's William? William started hopping around various cities in Minnesota. He spent a lot of time in Winona, Minnesota, which at the time was not a good place. Winona was actually one of the wettest cities in the United States during the Prohibition. Winona was home to the U.S.'s red light district. It was world renowned. Everyone knew about it. What's even sadder is that they would find babies floating down the Mississippi River from these girls in the red light district. It was just a bad place to be, which makes me wonder why did William decide to settle there? But of course he got in trouble there too, except before his hearing, the courts forced him to take a bath. William was sentenced to 2.5 years at Stillwater Correctional Facility. I found a news article talking about him leading the prison choir singing the handwriting on the wall during church services. I can't help but feel like he wanted to do better, but he was just such a broken man. Walter, part eight. By now, I'm sure we're all hoping that William would turn a new leaf when he was released from Stillwater Correctional Facility, but sadly, that was not the case. Roughly six to eight months after William is released from jail, he's seen with three of his buddies, William Radigan, Oscar Larson, and George Hendricks, buying two gallons of alcohol in Winona. The four homeless friends are never seen alive again. At 3.30 in the morning on April 24th, 1904, a train conductor discovers William's decapitated body dragging beneath the train. The four homeless men had laid down on the tracks, fallen asleep, and were killed instantly when the train ran them over. William's head was cut off and the remainder of their bodies were so badly mangled there was difficulty identifying them. My great, great, great-grandfather's official cause of death was killed by a locomotive, secondary cause alcoholism. Walter, part nine. Harry and Walter spent time in the children's home. I don't know how long Harry was there, but Walter was there for three to four years before being adopted. What really kills me is that their baby sister went to live with their grandfather and aunts, and Walter and Harry went to the home together and were then split up. Nonetheless, Walter was adopted, Harry was adopted. Things were looking up for the boys. Walter had a family. He worked on the farm. He started to learn skills. He got married. He and his wife had a baby. But then, as it seems to happen in this family, tragedy hits. Walter was one of the 50 million people worldwide that died of the Spanish flu in 1918 at only 28 years old. His baby was only six months old when he died. Fortunately for his widow, a local man took her and the baby in as his housekeeper. In kind of a happy ending, they lived together until their dying days as friends. Walter, my thoughts. This case actually took me six years to solve, and it is one that I poured a lot of time and energy and effort into. One of my big goals was to solve it before my grandpa died, because I know that this is a question that all of my grandpa and his siblings have wondered about. Knowing everything I know about this situation now, I can't help but wonder why William failed his kids. Was he an alcoholic before she died? Was she the one keeping him in check? Or did her death drive him to alcoholism? How scared must the kids have been? I can't help but imagine the neighbors popping in and William's passed out drunk and the boys are starving and the baby's crying. How many neighbor women must have popped in to wet nurse that baby so she didn't starve to death? And then for all three children to be split up permanently, forever, and never see each other again? Only for Walter to die at 28. This one hits hard.